Let's begin. We're in the book of Matthew. Um, we're going to begin, lost my place here, the wind blew it, the fan. We'll begin in chapter 10, verse 16. If you have your place, I'm going to ask you to join me standing as we continue on uh, studying the life of Jesus Christ. We are going to cover a good chunk of, of a chapter today. We're going from chapter 10, verse 16, all the way through about 42. Yeah, I said 42. But I promise I'll be brief. Right, there you go. That's what I like to hear. Can't make you any promises. Well, I'm standing, no pages are rustling. I'm going to read. The scripture reads in chapter 10, beginning in verse 16. He says, look, this is Jesus talking. I am sending you out as sheep among wolves. So be as shrewd as snakes and harmless as doves. Let's pray. Father. Father, I pray you'd bless the reading of your word this morning. Father, will you give me the very words to say? Father, un unpack your words for us, Lord. Help us to see what it means, and more importantly, Lord, how does it apply to us today? Father, we praise you and thank you for this time. We invoke your presence in this place. Father, will you glorify thy name? Amen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So what do we know? We're looking through the life of Jesus Christ. Last week when we were here, we said that Jesus said, pray to the Lord of the harvest. Remember that? We are, Jesus urges them to pray for the Lord of the harvest. He says, hey, you guys got to pray to the Lord of the harvest and ask him to send out his workers into the harvest to complete the work. There's too much work. Jesus, the Bible says that Jesus looked out and he saw the multitude and he was moved with compassion because they were harassed and like sheep without a shepherd. They had nobody to care for them. You know, and I imagine I am nowhere near as popular as Jesus Christ. If you, if you really read the scriptures and you pay attention, he was attracting a lot of people. And I think of me as your pastor, how difficult it is for me to be a minister, to a shepherd, to a congregation of just this size. It's challenging. It's challenging. We all got many needs, and to be there for everybody is not easy. It's hard. So what you do is you develop a system. The Bible teaches that deacons came alongside the, uh, the pastor, and they actually helped him minister to the flock. That's their job. That's their responsibility. We're the hands of the ministry. There's just too many people. And church, if you think this church right here, this body of believers, could actually effectively go out and win Highland or, or Griffith, you're sadly mistaken. You need leaders for that. We need to multiply ourselves. This is why our core value is to make disciples and cultivate leaders. The pastor can't do it by himself. And a lot of these churches that are dying today, if you look around and you find out why they're dying, they're dying. Brother Keith, take note. They are dying because we as a church culture have not d done them any favors right. by expecting our professional pastor to go out and knock on the doors and visit everybody and do it all by himself. All the hospital visits, all the home visits, all the follow-up visits with visitors and all that stuff. Way too much for one person to do. And, that, and uh, the, the church's attitude, their perception, hey, we pay the pastor, that's his job. That's a horrible attitude to have, and it's not a biblical one at all. In fact, Jesus said, pray to the Lord of the harvest. And in the subsequent passage, he says, he sends them out two by twos. Remember that? He sends them out because the workers are here. But you know what I can't do? I can't make you work. One of the frustrating things for me as a police officer, as a supervising, police officers are public servants. You know what that means? That means Anthony gets hired on the Hammond Police Department. He's got 10 years on the job. And Frank gets hired on the police department. He's got 10 years on the job. Neither one of them have been promoted beyond the rank that they currently have. You following me? Mm -hmm. So it's not like he's a sergeant and he's a lieutenant. That's different. That's different. There's parity in pay. But if they both are just patrol officers or whatever, or they're both sergeants or they're both lieutenants, Anthony could be a hard-charging, trailblazing worker, and Frank could be a sloth and they get paid the same. And I, as their supervisor, the only thing I could really do for Anthony is, hey, good job, keep up the good work, man, appreciate you. And I could do a little thing, but I really, I can't give him days off, can't give him a raise. There's things I cannot do. Now, Frank, I can make his life a little more difficult for him. I can disrupt it, but that's not, that's not to me, that's not, that's not how you lead. I mean, you can, but that's, that's not the most effective tool. Anyway, the point is, I can't, Make him work. Now, it's different. You know, like uh, if I own a, I don't know, pizza place. <laughs> and you come to work when you feel like it. You show up late if you want. You know what? You might be in the unemployment line. I just fire your behind. How's that sound? 
See, that's different. See, on the police department, we really can't do those things. You say, well, where are you going with this, Pastor? Glad you asked. I can't make you work. I can't make you want to. And when it comes to work for the Lord, working for the Lord, the service for the king, that comes from a heart that's developed in a relationship between you and him. And it flows, a natural flow. You want to. It's like when you love your wife or your husband or your significant other, your child. You love that person. You want to do for them. It's not a burden. Amen? It can be a burden, but we carry it gladly because we want to. That's different. It's been said that if you had to pay a mother what she was worth, an annual salary, we couldn't afford them. Think about that. I believe that's true. A mother, yet she doesn't usually draw a dime. Amen? And what does she do it for? She does it because she loves her children. It's just a natural overflow of her heart. And it should be the same in our relationships with our husbands and our wives. Not my husband, your husbands. And my wives, our wives. That's a whole other sermon. But uh, it should come natural. And so your desire to serve the Lord should come natural. It shouldn't have to guilt you into it. Jesus said, pray for the Lord, pray to the Lord of the harvest, and then he sent them out. In other words, God can motivate your heart to be that worker, but you can always say, no, I ain't doing it. Too lazy. I'm just going to sit here and be a bum for the Lord. Will you still go to heaven? I believe you will. I believe in eternal security, but I don't know if you've been genuinely saved. That's a whole other story. So as we look through this passage, we see Jesus sending out some 12 ordinary guys. Some of them were brothers. I really like that as my siblings are inside this church helping me serve the Lord. So now look at chapter 10, verse 16. This is the next event in Jesus' life after he sent out the 12. I'm going to cover a lot of verses, so stay with me. He says, look, I am sending you out as sheep among wolves. I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. He just sent out the 12, and he's telling them, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. Because the passage we read about him sending out the 12 concluded in verse 15 in the book of Matthew chapter 10. Ended in verse 15. Today's passage picks up in chapter 10, verse 16. So it's the subsequent verse. As he sends them out, he warns them, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Well, what do we know about sheep and wolves? One, we know that wolves are the predators. Amen? Sheep are the prey. How many of you have seen Zootopia? Oh, yeah. Okay. If you haven't seen it, go see it. Man, you're slacking. I can't share anything because I don't want to spoil it for you, but it's good. Sheep are the prey. Wolves are the predators. And you know who the shepherd is? The shepherd is the protector. He's the overseer of the flock of those sheep. When the wolf comes in, the shepherd takes his club and he bashes the wolf upside the head and says, God, get out of here. Leave my sheep alone. That's the shepherd's job. Now, Jesus says, I'm sending you out, sheep. And I'm over here, the shepherd's over here. He says, I'm sending you out. You're going to be like sheep, and you're going to be out there among the wolves. What's he talking about? Let's go to the next verse. We'll see. He says, beware. Go back to verse 16. This is NLT. So be as shrewd as snakes and harmless as doves. Anybody's translation, I'm looking for a synonym for the word shrewd. Because how many of you used the word shrewd in the last month in your your vocabulary. Anybody? I've heard wise. Wise? wise. Give me a synonym. Wise? Weary. Weary? Weary. Anybody else? Synonyms. Cunning. Astute. Perceptive. We have to be as sharp as a snake. Snakes are pretty sharp. They'll lay there. You walk right past them. They know you didn't see them. They'll lay there. You think they're a stick. If they know you've seen them up, they're ready to either try to flee or they're going to bite you. I'm sh- snakes are very cunning, very slick. What do we call that tricky, tricky person? What do we call them? That guy's a snake in the grass. Oh, right? Slithering on his belly like a reptile. Mm-hmm. Shrewd as snakes. So Jesus says, go out and be as shrewd as snakes. Be as cunning. Be as smart. Be as wise as snakes. And yet as harmless as doves. What does that mean? What does that mean? Shrewd as a snake, yet wise or as harmless as a dove. Snake will bite you. But as harmless as a dove. We have to be discerning. He says, I'm sending you out. You have to be, ju- you have to be discerning, not judgmental. There's a difference. You have to be discerning, wise, intelligent, astute. Pay attention, he's saying, as you go out. 
but be as gentle as a dove. There's a balance here, church. You say, okay, what does that look like? Well, the Bible teaches when they slap one cheek, you turn the other. Yet in the subsequent verses, he's going to say, when you're persecuted in this town, run to the next. So what does that mean? There's an old song, remember the gambler? You got to know when to hold them, and know when to fold them. Know when to walk away, and know when to run. Amen? That's what Jesus is saying. In the words of Kenny Rogers, that's what he's saying. He's not asking you to go out gambling. But he's telling you to be wise. He says, I'm sending you out and you have to be discerning. You've got to be smart enough to know when to be shrewd as a snake and when to be gentle as a dove. It's a, it's a healthy balance that's taking place. Verse 17. But beware, he says, for you will be handed over to the courts. You will be flogged with whips in the synagogues. All right. So we're looking at this, and you're like, all right, pastor, you say you preach for context. You want, how do we ap apply this application? How do we apply that? I'm not going to any synagogue. All right. Beware, you'll be handed over to the courts, and you'll be flogged and you, with whips in the synagogues. You will stand trial before the governors and the kings because you are my followers. Because you are my followers. But this will be your opportunity to tell the rulers and the unbelievers about me. Now, back up for just a second here. I started to share the story of St. Patrick. What I did not share was on his first Easter in Ireland, after he came back, he was held captive by the Irish. He was held a slave in Ireland from the age of 8 to 22. And when he went back home, he was rescued by some sailors. He became a priest, ordained, and then they sent him back to Ireland to evangelize the very people who enslaved him. Imagine that one. While he was there, his first Easter in Ireland, they, the, the king says only one fire can be built, just the fire to their polytheists. Only one fire built was St. Patrick built to fire anyway. And they summoned him before the king. He said, you can't do that. You're breaking the law or whatever. And he, he basically came and said, listen, his job was to convince them that there was one God, not many, and that one God loved them. And that the fire he built was symbolic of the light of Jesus Christ. He says, I'm not here to cause you any harm or any problems. But the point is this. The fire he used got him arrested, brought before the authorities, and he used that opportunity to share the gospel. Are you following me? We have a responsibility to take advantage of the opportunities that God gives us. He may put you in the path of the mayor that the rest of us don't have access to, or a chief of police, for example. And he puts you there for a reason and for a season. The scripture is full of examples, full of examples. Ruth is one. Daniel's another. Okay, we have that. Joseph's another. We can go on. I can go on. So we know this. So what do we know? He says, you will stand trial before the governors and the kings because you are my followers, because you are my followers, and this will be the opportunity for you to tell rulers about and others, unbelievers, about me. I think of a lady. It's about the time that the Supreme Court passed the, the gay marriage uh, law. They said, hey, you got to allow them to get married. There was a clerk in, uh, in, in and I forgot what state she was in. She says, I'm not signing the marriage certificate. Kentucky. 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 <laughs> That's your hometown or your home state, Keith? Further south, a little further south. Anybody from Kentucky in here? I'm not talking about Cedar Lake. <laughs> I'm kidding, Keith. He's like, you don't quit making fun of Cedar Lake. Kentucky. The lady in Kentucky, she said, I am not signing that marriage certificate because it goes against my Christian beliefs. Now, was she operating on conviction? Was she functioning on the conviction of the Holy Spirit? I am not the one to judge. But if she was, that was her platform. That was her opportunity to share the gospel. Okay? Now, the law is the law, and there was consequences for that. She went to jail. You guys remember that? Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Now, some of us are like, shoot, she's just signed the doggone thing. She's, if she's functioning on conviction, then she did the right thing. Right. You stand on what you believe. A wise man once told me, stand for something or you'll fall for anything. And she says, I am not signing that. Now, I don't know what your position is on gay marriage, and I'm not here to bash homosexuals. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about standing on what you believe. Okay? And she says, I stand on this conviction. This is a conviction that the Bible teaches this principle, and I am not giving out that, that, uh, that marriage license. And there was a natural consequence that came for that. So you'll stand before the governors and the kings because you are my followers. Not because you're hard-headed and refuse to obey the law, but because you're my followers and you're operating in principles. You're sticking to the spiritual principles regardless of the natural consequences that follow. Are you following me? Now, being shrewd as a snake, knowing when to stand, and as gentle, as harmless as a dove, she didn't come out and bash the homosexual community or bash the Supreme Court. She stood on her conviction. You see the difference? There's enough hate speech, people going around talking about these people and that people. Enough of that. Enough of that. 
That's not what Jesus is about. Amen? Amen. Jesus is about uniting and unifying. People say, well, you know, well, what would Jesus do? Well, that's what we're looking at. He says, I'm sending you out. Be as shrewd as a snake, but be as gentle as a dove. And, and consequently, he says, if you stand on your principles, you're going to be dragged before the governors and the kings because you are my followers. This will be your opportunity to tell them about me. This, this shook out in Acts chapter 4, where Peter and John heal a cripple. The Bible says the man was lame since birth. They heal him. It's where Peter tells them, hey, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give freely to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And the cripple gets up and he starts walking. People freak out. What in the world is going on? And they drag Peter before the, the, the Sanhedrin. He's standing there and they said, what? And, G and Peter said, he was dragged before. This actually panned out. This shook out like Jesus said it would. And he says, if, you're, if we're here to give an account about the good deed that we've done, then let it be known. He says, it is the power and the name of Jesus Christ in which this man stands healed. And so what they told him was, hey, oh, after a private sidebar, holy cow, I can't believe he's still talking about this Jesus dude who's been dead a while. They come, they huddle up. They come back and they say, okay, Peter, here's what you're going to do. You're going to shut your mouth about this Jesus dude. Do what you want, however you want, just keep Jesus out your mouth. And Peter's response was profound. He said, whether it's right for me to obey you rather than God, you be the judge. But as for me, he said, I cannot help but speak of the things I've seen and heard. So then these guys come back together and say, what are we going to do? And we can't do nothing. We're just send them out their way. Well, you can assure persecution sets in later as they start to make laws and start restricting all of this preaching of the gospel. But this is exactly what Jesus is talking about. And what do we know about time? The scripture says nothing new under the sun. The more things change, the more they stay the same. People are still being dragged, as in the case of Kentucky, where the people are still being dragged before the kings or the governors or the magistrates to give an account for their testimony, for their convictions on what they stand on, on what they believe. Amen? Now, the question is whether you would or you wouldn't. That's a good question. The little girl, Cassie, I forget her last name, in Columbine, where they put a pistol in her face and say, we want you to retract your faith in Jesus Christ, denounce Jesus Christ, your faith in Christ. She said, I will not. And bah, they shot and killed her. Many of us will say, hey, you know, I would do the same. You don't know what you would do when there's a pistol in your face. Okay? You pray for that type of courage. You pray for that kind of conviction to stand on what you say you believe. You pray for it. But when push comes to shove, you'll find out if you really got it or not. It takes a special fire in your belly to stand up when the pressure's coming in from all ends. And this pressure he's talking about is coming in from the, from the government, which we are clearly experiencing now in our time. We have the fundamental free, the fundamental right in this nation is the freedom of speech. When that's encroached upon, we got problems. There'll be a day where the, the, they're not, I'm not going to be able to stand here and preach like that. I'm going to have to turn my notes over to some authority who's going to read them over and see if my outline is good enough, if it's, a, if it's approved. There's going to be consequences for speaking. That's a problem. The fundamental, the fundamental right in this country is the freedom of speech. You should be able to say what I want. Now, you can't say what you want and harm people. You can't do that. But I have the right to my opinion and my freedom of religion. Jesus is saying exercise that right, but there's going to be consequences. It's just going to happen. And some of us will, and some of us will not. So where am I at here? Okay, so Jesus says, you'll be persecuted because, of, because you're my believers. Verse 19, when you are arrested, don't miss that. He didn't say if, when you are arrested, don't worry about how to respond or what you will say. God will give you the right words at the right time. For it is not you who will be speaking, it will be the Spirit of the Father speaking through you. Now, let me tell you what that does not mean. <laughs> the person you got a Sunday school lesson you got to teach next Sunday, I tell Frank, you got your lesson, you go, ah, God will give me the words. That is not what that passage is saying. You're going to preach a sermon next Sunday, and, you know, the night before, you know, I'm like, I don't have notes, church. I, don't, I get into the pulpit every Sunday without notes, and I do that intentionally. But if you don't think I have a pretty darn good idea of what I want to say, you're sadly mistaken. Okay, because the Bible says to be prepared in season and out of season to give an account. Colossians 4, 6 says uh, to season your words so that you'll be able to give an answer. And I'm paraphrasing here. So you'll be able to give a response to somebody when they ask a question. You can't just fill me up, Lord, give it to me, give me. It doesn't work that way. You have a responsibility. The scripture says study to show that self approved Amen? So we have a responsibility. That's not what this passage is teaching. You're going to get it through osmosis. Frank's got his head on his Bible back there like he's sleeping on it. I'll get it. That you ain't going to get it. Not like that. Okay, that's not what this passage is teaching. 
He's saying that in that time, be bold, be courageous, and the Spirit of God will jog your memory on the things that you've learned and will give you the boldness, the courage to speak it. That's what the passage is saying. Go to verse 21. Listen to this. This is incredible. When I was a Catholic, uh, one of the things they would do, we, they did what we do here, kind of like shaking hands, but you, you didn't get up and go up and down the aisles and hug people. And it was kind of like this. They're like, let us extend the right hand of fellowship. Uh, what is it? And so you, he'd say, Jesus said, I leave you peace. My peace I give you. And he, he'd look around and say, let us extend the sign of peace. And you look around and say, God bless you. Be good to be good. So you don't move much outside your pew. You're kind of like this, you know, like that. And that was really it. And so this peace that we're extending that hand of peace, that's not what he's talking about. Because look what verse 21 says. He says, a brother will betray his brother to death. A father will betray his own child. And children will rebel against their parents and cause them to be killed. Prophetic? Yeah. Yes. Do you see this today? Man, I cannot believe the things I see. Why? I don't know why I can't believe it. I should. Jesus said it would happen. Why do I not believe that? As we see little kids, kids, babies being harmed by their biological parents because they want to get back at the other one. So I got some babies, mama drama here. So I take my baby because I don't want her to have it and I... Am I, am I making this up? No. Crazy. Fathers killing their kids, not just fathers. Children rebelling against their parents. Wow, that's, that's a new one. I haven't seen that before. Brother rising against brother. Go back to verse 20. For it is not your will who be speaking, it will be the spirit of your father speaking through you. Okay, he's talking about this very crazy time that's coming. In verse 21, he goes on to explain. Now listen, this is the point. I said that the pressure, I said it takes a special kind of something to stand up against the pressure, especially when it's caving in from all ends. Remember, I just said that. Now, the special kind of pressure, I said in this particular passage in verse 20, actually 19 and 20, is coming from the government. Verse 21, go to 21, is now coming from within. It's coming from the family. You freeze? Verse 21. A brother will betray his brother to death. A father will betray his own child. And a children will rebel against their parents and cause them to be killed. Go to verse 22. And all the nations will hate you because you are my followers. You know, America's coasting on the blessings of our forefathers. Yes. God blessed America. He did. And he still does. But that ship is, the momentum is coming to an end. Quick. If you're not paying attention you're going to be caught by surprise. You're going to wake up one day and say, what happened? The bubble's going to go. The spiritual blessings, I'm telling you, I'm not a prophet of God by any stretch of the imagination, but it doesn't take a prophet to see it. We're coasting on the blessings of our forefathers. Says, All the Haitians will, nations will hate you because you are my followers. America has risen to the position in which it is today because of the blessings of God Almighty. Make no mistake of it. And, and every empire that's ever arised in, 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 our, in our history has crumbled. And they crumble because they become godless. They don't need God anymore. They turn their back on God. That's what's happening here. We're going to get the rug pulled out from under our feet. It's going to come tumbling down. And you're like, hey, Pastor, man, I come to get encouraged today. You're discouraging me. Take courage. Jesus said, I've overcome the world. Amen. Amen. So what do we know? He says, but everyone who endures to the end will be saved. There is going to be a time where our nation is going to get jacked up. And I think we're there. Okay, even members of our own household are going to be in opposition, he says. Brother against brother, father against son, and so on and so forth. You want to spark a debate? Talk politics. That's the quick way to get stabbed, I'm telling you, especially in a Hispanic household. Yeah, well, I ain't going to say, but I got to say, my first Thanksgiving on the police department, I went to a white Caucasian household where one brother stabbed the other one in the eye with a fork because he ate all the beets. And I said, cool, it ain't just us, you know, Hispanics, because that's something that happened in a house like ours. I didn't think it happened with white people, but it does. <laughs> Sin, man is totally depraved. Whether you're black, white, or Hispanic, it don't matter. We're all jacked up. Amen? Brother will betray his brother. I just shared that story with you. 
father will betray his own child, and children will rebel against their parents and cause them to be killed. I've seen some devious and diabolical things happen with children due to their parents. I can't even, I can't even imagine. My mother is 70, but she was born in what, 60? Of course, she was born in 42, so she's what, 74. She'll be 74 May 8th. I'm 44. So I'm 30 years younger than my mom. But I'm a grown doggone man. You think I'm going to talk to my mom, my 74-year-old mom, the, any way I feel like it? No. Even if I don't get along with her, you know, if there's really just not really, we just bad blood, then I just stay away from her. I would never disrespect my mother, never. At 44 years old, I would never talk to my mother the way I see kids talk to their parents right. today. Never. Never. And if my mom smacked me in my mouth today at 44, I'm telling you right now, I would not like that at all. I'm not a hands-on kind of guy. I don't want nobody smacking me in my face. But if my mom smacked me, I'd be mad. And I would leave her home, boiling hot, and I would go home, and I'd, I'd stew, and I might call somebody. And like, Can you believe my crazy mom smacked me? I, you know, I might do that. But do you think I would smack her back? Do you think I would curse her out? You must be out your mind. You must be out your mind. And I don't understand it. I don't understand it. But you know what? Why should we be surprised? The scripture says, let's go, that it will happen. And he says, but everyone who endures to the end will be saved. Ha, ah, works, right? Stand strong, be faithful, and you'll be saved. That's not what this passage is saying. That's what it said, Pastor. It says, stand strong to the end, stand, endure to the end, and you'll be saved. That is not what it's saying. Somebody have a different translation for verse 22? I'm reading NLT. Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? No? Verse 22. One who stands firm to the end. Is that what you said? Okay. All nations will hate you because you're my followers. And everyone who endures to the end will be saved. What does that mean exactly? Well, what we know is what it doesn't mean is that that's what you have to do in order to be saved. That is not what it's teaching. Why do we know that? Because it contradicts the rest of the scripture that says, for by grace you are saved. Amen? Right. For by grace we are saved through faith. It is a gift of God, not of ourself, lest any man should boast. So I said, what is this passage saying then? Clearly it, con it conflicts with the you're saved by grace. No, it does not. What it's saying is that anything... Here, I, this commentator said it best. Let me read this to you. The real test of value, of value, is how well something holds up under wear, tear, and stress of everyday life. The real test of value is how well something holds up to wear, tear, and stress of everyday life. I think of a commercial I seen when I was a kid. It was a Subaru commercial. It was a, you know, I don't know. if you drive a Subaru, I apologize. But it's supposedly not, you know, this great car is real small and cute, and they're worried about dinking tearing it up. So the kids are getting out the car and they're closing the door all gentle. And I think the, this is an old commercial. I'm dating myself. And the father goes, hey, it's a Subaru. And everybody goes, ah, oh, Subaru. So they start slamming doors. Bam, bam, boom. They start abusing the car because it can hold up under the wear and tear. What do we know about the Timex? It what? takes a licking takes a lickin and what? Keeps on, Keeps on ticking. Value is measured by how well something holds up under wear and tear. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. So this is what he's saying. The value of your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ is going to reveal itself and how well you hold up under the wear and tear and the stress of everyday life. Those of us who say we have faith in Jesus Christ and then we start wondering and whining and crying when things go bad. We say he's Lord of all, but then we freak out when something ain't going our way. Either he's Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. Amen. So we want it all to go our way as long as everything's cool. Hey, he's Lord. Jesus is Lord. And then when it doesn't go our way, we're like, oh, my gosh. Pray for me. And I'm saying there's nothing wrong with that, but the Bible clearly teaches us not to worry because God is still on his throne, amen? And he's either sovereign or he's not. And he certainly is not on vacation. He's certainly not taking a nap. God is not slow. He's not blind. He sees. He knows what's going on. So if the value of our relationship holds up under the wear and tear and the stress of life, he says those who stand up for Christ in spite of the troubles truly have a lasting value and will receive a great reward. You understanding that it is not the, the enduring to the end is the byproduct of your relationship. Amen? 
We see symptoms of, of a person's uh, illness. When a person, you look at hey, he's got, he's got, a, he's got a cold. Well, how do you know he's got a cold? He's got a runny nose, he's got watery eyes, he's got a cough, he's got a fever. The fever, the cough, and the watery eyes are the symptoms of the cold. Amen? It's the byproduct. And so what we know about a person who loves and trusts Jesus Christ, they walk upright in confidence in that relationship through the good and the bad. We don't buckle under pressure and say, well, you know, it's convenient to be a Christian today, so I will be, but tomorrow I won't be. I'll take off my my Christian necklace, or I'll hide my, my God t-shirt, turn it inside out so nobody sees I'm a Jesus freak. That's what I'm talking about. The question is, people ask, hey, if, the, if you was on trial today for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you of it? And the, most, the average Christian, the answer is no. You're probably not going to get persecuted. You're probably not going to experience these challenges in your life because you're a closet Christian. Nobody knows it. Your faith doesn't really mean anything to you. Outside of that, this is what he's saying. Stand strong, stand firm, despite the circumstances. Don't buckle, don't bend, don't turn. Amen? Amen. And this is, what is, this is what he's preparing them for. They haven't even went out yet. He's sending them out, and he's telling them, be shrewd as snakes, be as harmless as doves, be careful. It's going to come. The pressure's coming from inside the family and outside the family, from the government. But stand firm on what you believe. Anybody, by a show of hands, you don't have to if you don't want to, is there anybody here who is a Christian, I hope you are, and has family member that is not, and you get pressure from the non-family member because of your beliefs? What do you know? A couple hands go up. Verse 22, he says, all the nations are going to hate you. Verse 23, look what he says. When you are persecuted in one town, flee to the next. I tell you the truth, the Son of Man will, not, will, re, will return before you have reached all of the towns of Israel. All of the towns of Israel. Before all of Israel is reached, Jesus says, I'll be back. And no, he's not the terminator, but he will terminate. You know, I had a, uh, she here? Paige. Paige came to me and she says, hey, Pastor, I have a question. They're doing Awanas, and uh, Bob brought her over to me to ask him. And she told me, she says, Pastor, I, I didn't know the world was going to come to an end. I said, what do you mean? She goes, I thought, you know, life goes on. You know, 150 million years from now, the earth keeps spinning, people die, people are born, and life keeps on trucking. I said, that's not a biblical picture at all, not from this current world. And she's like, what? And she was asking questions about Revelation in the end times. Kid, how old is Paige? Nine. So I had to give it to her at a nine-year-old level. And she was like, wow. But she thought, the world just kept on trucking. She didn't realize that this age will come to an end. And Jesus right here says, I tell you the truth, the Son of Man will be back before you have reached all of Israel, all the towns of Israel. Before everybody is reached for the gospel, he says, I'll be back. Students are not greater than their teacher, and slaves are not greater than their masters. Oh, Jesus is condoning slavery. No, he is not. He is not. There's people who need to be reached. If you're a slave, you heard of prison ministries? I had somebody call here and say, hey, do you have a prison ministry? I said, no, we don't. Maybe we should, but we don't. Or maybe you should do it, Pastor. Or maybe you should. I have people come to me, hey, Pastor, I got a great idea. I'm like, really? You want to run with it? Oh, no, no. I expect you to do it. Listen, we probably should have a prison ministry. Who's going to reach those prisoners? Right? It's, the same. it's what I'm talking about. Brother Solomon had mentioned to me that he was involved with one years ago. The point is, if you have a slave who's actually in the book of Philemon is one. It's an example of the slave who actually was uh, leading other slaves to, to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. He actually has something in common. Jesus is not condoning slavery. He's saying that, you know what, the slave in this case, because it was part of the culture, is not inferior to the master. Look at verse 25. Students are not greater than their teachers, and slaves are not to are, are be like their masters. And since I... The master of the household have been called the prince of demons, Jesus says. Even I've been called Satan. Jesus is saying, I'm being attacked. I'm being ridiculed for what I do and for what I say. Me. The member of my household will be called by even worse. I had a, uh, you ever hear somebody, I said, hey, I met this dude the other day. Uh, and his, I thought his name was Terry. I thought his name was Jerry. I called him Jerry, and when he responded on the text, it said Terry. I said, oops. So when I seen him, when I met him face to face, I shook his hand. I said, sorry, dude, I thought your name was Jerry. And he says, I've been called worse. 
And I laughed. And I said, well, who hasn't, right? Christian, you're going to be called some stuff, especially if you stand on biblical truth. We seem, the word of the Lord endures how long? Forever. How long? Forever. Forever. Doesn't change. Amen? Amen. <laughs> now, if God's word endures forever, then his principles are timeless. They're going to be, God is immutable. He's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. Amen? Amen? Which is a good thing. Amen. You ain't got to worry about how he feels tomorrow when he wakes up. As if God was taking a nap. Okay? But you don't have to worry about God on a whim just killing us. <laughs> taking us all out because he got mad. God don't function that way. So here, uh, the... He says that, you know, you're going to be called even worse. If you stand on biblical truth, if you stand on biblical principles, if you live your life by conviction, you're going to be called narrow-minded. Yep. You're going to be called a bigot, fanatic. a fanatic. You'll be called all kinds of things. I know for sure that Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but through me. So when people say all religions are valid, I say, okay, yeah, valid, what it depends on your definition of valid. And all religions lead to God. That would also depend on what your perception of God is. But my God, the God of this Bible, the Bible clearly teaches that there's one way. Now, people don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear it. You ignorant. You narrow-minded. You hard-headed. You're so ultra-conservative that you can't even be a moderate. And, and I'm like, I, I, can't, I can't tell you something is okay that the Bible says is not. I can't tell you something is so that the Bible clearly teaches against. I can't. I can't. Amen? Amen. And when I can't, you're going to be called all kinds of things. You just are. Mm -hmm. So you know, a lot of Christians do. Mm. <laughs> what do you think? Mm. Mm. You want to tell me your opinion? Mm-mm. Mm. -mm. mm. That's better than swaying. Keep your mouth shut. If you, right. can't, if you can't say anything, if you can't stand on your conviction, keep your mouth shut. If you got something to say, say it. But the Bible says, what did he say? Be as shrewd as a snake, yet as gentle as a dove, or harmless as a dove. All right, verse 26. But don't be afraid of those who threaten you, for the time is coming when everything that is covered will be revealed. And all that is secret will be made known to all. What I tell you now in darkness, shout abroad when daybreak comes. What I whisper in your ear, shout it from the housetops for all to hear. Don't be afraid of those who can kill your body, yet cannot touch your soul. Fear God who can destroy both your soul and your body in hell. Now, this goes back to our physical bodies and our ailing bodies and our sicknesses and whatnot. We say, you know what, I, I trust God, but, and I want God to heal me, but God doesn't. Well, you know, God has a different plan for you. But his, his real chief goal is to save your soul. That's his ultimate goal. If he chooses to leave you here in good health so that you could continue to serve him, well, praise the Lord. But if he chooses to call you home, praise the Lord. Amen. And see, that's not something we want to wrap our head around. You know why? Because we have selfish agendas. I have a grandson that I love dearly. And Tina and I talk about 10 years from now, he'll be born up, he's going to be turning 14. What's he going to look like? What's he going to be like? I can only imagine. Do I want to be here for that? Yes. So I don't really, really, I'm not ready to go to heaven today. How many of us feel that way? I want to go to heaven, just not today. <laughs> if God calls you home, you praise him anyway. He says, don't be afraid of those. We're worried about those. If God puts you in a prison cell, now that's easy for us to say because we're free. If God puts you in a bed and you're bedridden for the rest of your life, that's where he puts you. Stay faithful. And we're like, oh, hey, pastor, I don't want to be in a bed. I don't want to be in a prison. That's the, and I understand that. And he says, don't be worried about those who can kill your body. When a person says, do you believe in God? And he's got the gun to the girl's face. And he says, renounce your Christianity or I'm going to kill you. The Bible says, fear not the person who can harm your body but cannot touch your soul. Amen. And that girl had the stones to stand up and say, I'm not. And he went, pow. And off she went. Some of us are thinking, man, that was dumb. She should have just lied. God knows your heart. She could have just said, God knows she didn't mean it. God knows she was scared. God, she could ask for forgiveness. God forgives. That's all true. But she didn't. She stood on her conviction. And she was not fearing the person that could harm her body, but couldn't touch her soul. She said, I fear God who can do both. And she stood upright. The, something worth value stands up under the stress and the wear and tear of the pressures of life. And that girl stood up. 
I pray for that kind of courage, church. I can stand here boldly from the pulpit and proclaim that today. I pray I have the same boldness if I was ever faced with the same scenario. Verse 29, what is the price of two sparrows? One copper coin, we'll call it a penny. But not a single sparrow can fall to the ground without your father knowing it. And the hairs on your head, they're all numbered. Some of us have higher numbers than others. <laughs> but they're all numbered. The very number of hairs on your head are numbered. Verse 31, so don't be afraid. You are more valuable to God than all. A whole flock of sparrow. And look at verse 32. This is important. This is where that girl in Columbine stood. This is where the apostle Peter stood. And this is where we need to stand. Everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. And everyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. I have a member of the church. I did not ask for permission to share their name, so I will not. But the person wanted to be baptized. Prior to that, when the person came to me and said, I want to be baptized, and they asked me, can they do it privately? They didn't want to do it in front of all of you guys. It's embarrassing. My hair is going to get wet and flat, and I don't want to do that. So I just gave you a huge clue. But anyway, this person did not want to do it in front of the congregation, which I understand. Then there come a time when I was preaching about martyrs' deaths and people standing with courage and conviction on what they believe. This person told me I will never share my faith, ever, because it's so hokey. It's just so awkward. It feels so phony. It's just, I don't, I just, uh, what if I taught you how? Ah, it's not my thing. A few weeks later, the person comes back and said, I want to be baptized. I said, on a Sunday morning? I said, on a Sunday morning. I said, what about your hair? They said, I don't care. I said, my Lord died for me publicly. I'm willing to make my proclamation of faith public in front of everybody else. In fact, invited people to watch the, the wedding of the hair. Okay, not embarrassed, not ashamed and willing to stand and, and acknowledge Jesus Christ and the commitment she's made before God Almighty. And a church full of people. Now, he says, everyone who denies me here on earth will also be denied by my Father in heaven. And then this person also told me, you know what? I can't shut up. I tell everybody about the Lord. Just can't shut up. Something happened. Amen? Something happened in this person's life. So I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, okay, Jesus says, deny me in front of God, I'll deny you. In front of, deny me here on earth in front of people, I'll deny you in front of God the Father. But if you uh, stand up for me here, he says, I will acknowledge you before, people, before my Father in heaven. Verse 33, everyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. Don't imagine that I've come to bring peace on earth. I've come not to bring peace, but a sword. Jesus said, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. What does that mean? You know what? Nothing, uh, I won't say nothing. Politics is one. But outside of politics, religion is the next thing that, bring, that just incites violence. Somebody don't want to believe what you believe. They want, I mean, it's just ridiculous. And, and it's just, it's, so how many killings have taken place in the name of God? You know how many? Millions of lives. Millions of lives. It's crazy. He said, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. And Jesus talked about the brother rising above, above brother, rising against a brother. Go to verse 36, 35, sorry. I went to heaven high. <laughs> I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her, her mother-in-law. Verse 36, if you can't say amen, you say, ah, it's verse 36. Your enemies will be right in your own household. Your enemies will be right in your own household. Oh, my goodness. How can Jesus say that? Jesus is the great unifier. He said, whomsoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But some people just don't want to call. And that's a choice that they have. We choose to call. They choose not to. You have, you have, you have conflict in your very own home. And Jesus says in verse 37, if you love your father or mother more than you love me, you are not worthy of being mine. People say, whoa, whoa, hold on a second. Wait, listen. The, one of the commandments says, honor thy mother and thy father. Amen? One of the original Ten Commandments says, honor thy mother and thy father. Right? So how in the world can Jesus say, if you love your father and mother more than you love me, you're not worthy of being mine? Now, the family ties, the family commitments are very, very important, especially in culture at this time. So he's not undoing that. What he's saying is that I have a T-shirt. Somebody got me, and I can't remember who it was because I almost never buy nothing for me. Everything I own is just about to gift. It says, God first, 
Family second, then the bears. <laughs> All right? Somebody at work saw me in that shirt and says, God, nah, family first. And I said, dude, you can't even possibly love your family right unless you love God. And God shows you how to love God. Uh, of course, this person's lost. Right. Okay, so what Jesus is saying, your love for God should come first. And it should filter down to your family. He's not saying, he's saying if you love your family more than me. You know what that means? People make excuses. There's a passage where the guy tells Jesus, hey, I'll follow you, Lord, but let me bury my dad first. And Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. People are like, man, that's harsh. The, the context was that the father wasn't even dead yet. For all we know, he might have been 60 years old and lived to be 120. He said, he's telling Jesus, I'll follow you in 60 years. That was me when God said, hey, I want you to be a pastor. I want you to pastor. I said, nah, Lord, I'm not going to do that. God said, yes, you are. I said, okay, I'll do it after I retire. And God said, no, you're going to do it now. I said, no, I ain't going to do it now. We had this big argument. So Jesus says, look, you, we use our families as an excuse not to serve. Oh, I can't come to church today because X, Y, or Z. Now, I'm not saying be in church when your daughter or your son has a program. You need to trump the program church. I'm not saying that. I'm saying is your commitment to God should be first. And what does that look like? That's up to you. You know, how is your faith, your attendance? How is your serving? How is your giving? That's the question. And if you're not, show, you, it should show itself. Love is an action word it shows. Amen. So Jesus says, if you love your father or your mother more than you love me, you're not worthy of being mine. If you love your son or your daughter more than me, you're not worthy of being mine. You know, that should hit you right between the eyes. Especially when it comes to raising our kids. Sometimes we want to do, sometimes we don't want to do. But, you know, what does the Bible teach? Amen? Go to the next verse. If you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you're not worthy of being mine, Jesus said. There's a sacrifice that comes with it. Verse 39. If you cling to your life, this was mentioned yesterday at the rally. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. Jesus is promising you something greater. You hold on to the very life that you have, whether it's your finances, your time. You know what we value most? Our leisure. Our leisure time. You know what I love doing? I love riding my motorcycle. Love it. Beautiful day, I'm riding out there, and that's my act of worship. And I worship in my bike as I ride through the countryside, and I'm looking at these barns and these silos and the winds blowing. I'm looking at the man. Northwest Indiana is beautiful. It is. I know it's hard to believe, but it is. Driving down the lakefront, I'm thinking, man, I'm really just worshiping God and, and the ability he's given me to even own a motorcycle. I just love that. But if I do that on a Sunday morning instead of coming to church, or I do that on Tuesday nights, and I do that, I pour all my money into this bike instead of being a faithful giver to my church, and I serve my bike by changing the oil and changing my tires, and I mean, doing all the service and all of the, the, all, all the attention goes to my bike, you know, how much do I really love God? I can say what I want. It's just lip service. Verse 40, anyone who receives you receives me. And anyone who receives me receives my father. You see the correlation? It's like this. Who sent me? Verse 41. If you receive a prophet as one who speaks for God, you will be given the same reward as the prophet. If you receive the righteous people because of their righteousness, you will be given a reward like theirs. I'm going to conclude in verse 42. Go ahead. And if you give even a cup of cold water to one of the least of my followers, you surely will be rewarded. Verse 42 in a different translation. Anyone? When it says the least of my followers, I'm looking for the word. Verse 42. What? Little. Little ones. That's what I thought. What did you say, Manny? Little, Little ones. Anyone else? Fern? Jesus is talking about children, ministering to children. Why does he use children? Typically, we have, no, we have no reward when you minister to a child. Kid doesn't have any influence in your life. You come to this baby kid and you, take, you do something nice, something selfless for this child. They typically don't have a way to repay you. They don't have money to give back to you. They, they don't have a, a job they can offer you. The kid doesn't have a position in life. And so when we, are, when we are generous to the least of these children or those who are even less fortunate, for the right reasons, your heart's in the right place, Jesus said, you will surely be rewarded. Selflessness. Many of us don't mind doing for others when we think we can get something in return. But a true 
act of self, selflessness. I have to tell you, and I don't know, I pray that the Lord gives me uh, wisdom when it comes to that because I just can't give money to everybody who asks. But uh, we were in Chicago one day, and we passed a bunch of homeless people. For whatever reason, this one guy stuck out to Brother Frank, and he said, pull over. And we pulled over, and he jumped out the car, and the guy was in the trash can, and he had a cup of water. He took a cup of melted ice that somebody threw in, and he took the lid off, and he was drinking it. And Frank went over there and gave him some money because he was moved by, with compassion when he saw the guy. Now, why this guy and not the other 99 homeless people we saw, I don't know. Just the other day, Tina and I were in the parking lot. Ooh, we was at a store, and this guy walked up behind me. He's going to ask me, hey, I'm out of gas, you know, the old gas scam. Yeah. You know, and I'm just this old. This is the days long. But he walked up behind me, and I'm very attentive. My head is on a swivel. I don't know if that's the policeman in me or if it's just the hood rat. I don't know what it is, but I'm always looking over my shoulder, always. You know, you have to sneak up on me real good to get me because I'm always looking. And uh, I saw the dude when I came out, and he's walking towards me, and he got just close enough. I turned around. I told him I loaded up my fist. I don't know what he wants. You get out a gun or not. I don't know, but I'm ready just in case. And uh, he looks. He goes, hey. And I said, nah. Just like that. And he goes, and he walked away from me. And I was like, and I felt bad. The guy was clearly going to ask me for something. He was going to ask for gas or something, I'm pretty sure. And I cut, shut him down. I said, get away from me, dude. Walk up. I'm trying to put my grandson in the car. You're going to walk up behind me. I don't know what you want. You know, he just kind of freaked me out, and I got defensive. But I felt kind of bad about that. But there's other times where I moved, and I give money, and I help, and I don't know. I, and I ask God for, gui for, for guidance there because I don't know. I can't give to everybody. I can't give it all away. And another brother asked me the other day, why not? Why can't we just give it away? Really, how much does we need? I don't know. But Jesus says when you give to the least of these, you will be rewarded. What about that guy who just scammed you? He has money in his pocket. You know what? You let God worry about that. But it's, this is a tough one. The point is this, selflessness. We don't normally function that way. Jesus prepares his disciples for persecution. It's going to come from without the government, and it's going to come from within. But you still need to stand on your convictions regardless, and you need to be a minister regardless of the cost. And Jesus says there's benefit, there's a reward in it. And I have to ask you, church, where are you at in that? Some of you are like, hey, Pastor, I don't even have these problems. Well, you're probably not doing anything for the Lord. That's just the truth. Because if you start to serve him, Jesus said you will be persecuted, not because you're a lazy sloth at work, but because you're my followers. You'll be persecuted. Stand firm to the end. I have to ask you, how are you doing? I'm going to ask the praise team to come up. I want you to reflect in your life. Ask yourself, what are you doing for the kingdom's sake? How are you serving God? Are you, re are you receiving persecution? Are you being pressured at work or by family or friends? You ask God for strength to stay fir stand firm, to do what he's called you to do, and that's to be a witness in this dark world. We need to be the light of the world. We need to be reflecting the light of Jesus Christ in our life. And I don't know if you've even had that opportunity, but I promise you this. If you, if you haven't, you will. It will come. And you'll be surprised at how fast it'll come, how frequently it will come. You'll be surprised at just how difficult it is to keep that light shining. It can be hard. But this is what the Lord has asked us. He's preparing us for this. He's telling you this is coming. It is clearly in our society today. It's clear. And it's just going to get worse, I promise you. So I want you to reflect in that, reflect on that, and re-examine your own life and ask yourself, how faithful are you? Would you have the audacity? Would you have the stones? Would you have the guts to stand up to the pressure that comes from the government to say, this violates my Christian principles? Will you have the guts to stand up against your family members or your friends who tell you you are crazy, you're, you're zealous, and you're just a religious freak? Will you have the, the courage to stand up Shrewd as a snake, yet harmless as a dove, but to stand on your convictions. Will you have it? That's a good question. Many of us will sit here today and say, yeah, I'll have it. You will never know until the time comes. I want you to ask that, ask God that, and to be truthful with yourself. And ask God, where are you in that? I'm going to ask you to join me standing. As we sing our response song, I want you to search your heart, to be that witness that God has called you to be, to be bold and to stand on your convictions. Remember, the wise man told me, you stand for, you stand for something or you'll fall for anything.